Hi, everybody. How are we doing today? Can you all hear me okay? Okay. I can do this without the mic, but then the people on Zoom can't hear me. So, um, so good evening, good afternoon. I'm Kerry Cranston, President of the American Writers Museum. I'm here to welcome you um, to our program this evening. I just have to cover a few housekeeping things for tonight's program. If you're new to the American Writers Museum um, and you uh, enjoy tonight's program, uh, I want you to know that members receive um, free admission to special programs, discounts on programs that we do. We do programs all the time. So if you want to become a member, please feel free to ask somebody at the front desk tonight or go online. Um, and we also have special events like tomorrow night's Get Lit um, that we have member discounts for. Get Lit is a monthly event uh, with cocktails and activities and fun things to do in the museum. So if you want to come tomorrow night, the theme is Pride, and we'll be having all kinds of fun activities around Pride. Um, and every month the theme is different. So please come to our next uh, Get Lit if you don't want to come to tomorrow night's. Um, so uh, some of you have already bought copies of the books for tonight's author. Um, and if you did not, uh, our book selling partner in the back is Seminary Co-op, and you can buy a copy from them. If you are online and you would like to buy a copy, um, there will be a link in the chat to Seminary Co-op, and you can buy the book directly from them. Um, speaking of our friends online, if you have questions for our author tonight, um, please type them in the Q&A box. Look on the bottom of your screen, it says Q&A, and you can type questions in there. And when we get to the Q&A portion of the evening, we will read them out. Um, and uh, for those of you here who would like to ask questions when we get to the Q&A part of the evening, this microphone is gonna be in that little stand right there. And we just ask you to neatly line up um, to ask your question. I will point out to everybody online and to everybody in the audience that a question is usually about a sentence in length and ends with a question mark. <laughs> Um, but I want to thank you all for being here and supporting the past, present, and future of American writing. We're excited to hear um, tonight about an extraordinary story of history, medicine, and friendship in Lisa C.'s new book, Lady Tan Circle of Women. Now, Lisa C. has a very long vitae, so I need to read, so pardon me. Lisa C. is the New York Times bestselling author of The Island of the Sea, Women, sorry, the Tea Girl of Hummingbird Lane, Snowflower in the Secret <coughs> Far, Peony fan. in Love. Fan. Oh, fan. This is the problem with my cheap reading glasses. Peony in Love, Shanghai Girls, China Dolls, and Dreams of Joy, which debuted at number one. She is also the author of On Golden Mountain, which tells the story of her Chinese-American family settlement in Los Angeles. She was the recipient of the Golden Spike Award and the Chinese Historical Association of Southern California and the History Makers Award from the Chinese American Museum. She was also named National Woman of the Year by the Organization of Chinese American Women. She's joined in conversation tonight by novelist, short story writer, and journalist, Joanne Liedem Ackerman, who is also a member of the American Writers Museum's Board of Trustees. So thank you, and please welcome both of them here tonight. Well, thank you, Carrie. Now I don't have to give Lisa's bio, so this, <laughs> this makes it a lot easier. But I will offer a little bit um, of a bio. Um, I lived in Los Angeles and knew Lisa before she'd even written a novel. I think you were West Coast um, correspondent for Publishers Weekly. But I knew her mom who was just the maven, the doyen of LA writers and extremely supportive of young writers, including me. So I have just fond memories of um, Carolyn. And I knew Lisa when she and her mom and her mom's partner started writing books called um, Mo From Monica Highland. Now Monica is Santa Monica Boulevard and Highland Boulevard is another street in Los Angeles. And they wrote two books together. Three, uh, three books together, three books together. Um, and then I had moved to London by the time On Golden Mountain came out. But um, I'm a mother of a writer who's doing extremely well right now. And I remember my mother used to say, your children should leap off your shoulders. Well, Lisa, you have leapt. <laughs> and I, I know how proud Carolyn was of Lisa and how by the end sort of awed by you. And um, I, I can appreciate that. So, um, you know, your, your books, the thing that, that impresses me is that Lisa, However, and I'd love for you to maybe answer the question, did it, she really saw herself and carved out who she was going to be as a writer and everything connected, starting with your nonfiction book with your Chinese background, then every book with the, re the deep research, the storytelling, 
everything connects. And the other thing extremely impressive to me as a writer about Lisa is how well she is at the business. Because you not only have to be a writer with imagination to put out a book, but then you have to be an entrepreneur to have your books out there. And she's extremely respectful and caring of her readership, which follows her devotedly. And um, uh, that's impressive. A lot of writers don't do that as well as you do. And what, there's one other thing I want to say before we launch into the book is if you're trying to learn about a culture or country, you can read its politics, its um, economic books, its history. But if, once you've done that, read a really good novel, because that will put everything into perspective in a storytelling and character. And I think you learn about a country, and Lisa has done that. So to launch into this book, I, I hope you'll tell us a little bit about how it came to be. And then the first theme I would love for you to talk about, which permeates the book in a lot of your writing, is the idea of yin and yang. And okay, well, you've got two things going already. So, I know. so <laughs> his, history of the book in origin sure. and then taking on the yin and the okay. yang. Well, okay, well, first, just I want to just say how happy I am to be here at the American Writers Museum and in Chicago. I love this city, and so it's just so great to be here. And uh, so wonderful to be with you, yes. Joanne. And I was just, uh, Joanne was in Los Angeles about a month or so ago with the launch of her book. And so I got to be at her book event. So that's, it's really nice to be together. So this book came about very differently than any of my others. I typically think about a book for 5, 10, 15, 20 years uh, before I decide this is the one. I thought I knew what the next book was going to be. I'd been quietly doing research for a couple of years. Um, in March 2020, the paperback of Island of Sea Women came out. I went out on what was supposed to be like a six week book tour. I went to five states in five days and then the city, the city, the city, the world shut down and I went home. And the thing about that idea that I had been quietly working on was that it was going to require a trip deep, 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 deep into a very remote part of China. No way to do that in 2020, no way in 2021, it, no way in 2022. You know, the quarantines just recently lifted, but even today I'd be very reluctant to go someplace so remote. So that idea was just gone. And I hate to sound um, melodramatic, but I spent a good part of 2020 just moping around at home and thinking, and again, oh, some melodrama here, my life is over. <laughs> you know, just like my life is over. I can't go to China to do research all of the libraries, all of the archives were closed. I mean, UCLA, you know those libraries. I've been in all seven research libraries there, and they were closed for about two years. So there was just, you know, it was just like, well, my life is over. And so let's see, you know, I bought a pair of pajamas, my very first. <laughs> I bought a second pair, you know, and, and so things just sort of, I was just at home at loose ends. I spoke to a lot of um, did a lot of stuff online, you know, talking, well, like this is online, right? But doing a lot of it then, uh, I spoke with, the, since I couldn't go out, you know, on tour, I spoke to a lot of book clubs to support Island of Sea Women. There was a moment that summer when I spoke to like four book clubs a day on Zoom. I mean, it was just, you know, because I had nothing in, else to do. In your and I would, in my, well, I would be dressed from the waist up, okay? <laughs> Anyway, um, in October of that year, I was just walking through my office and I have a whole wall of research books there. And the spine of one of the books popped out at me. I don't know why, it was light gray lettering, with, was light gray with slightly darker gray lettering, but it popped out and I pulled it down, reproducing women, pregnancy and childbirth in the Ming Dynasty. And I looked, I'd had that book on my shelf for 10 years, I'd never opened it. And I thought, well, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic, my life is over, now's the moment. And so I sat down right then and started to read. I got to page 19 when there was a mention of a um, woman doctor in the Ming Dynasty 
right there, pretty extraordinary, 500 years ago, who in 1511, when she turned 50, I liked that 50 part, um, published a book of her cases. And I just thought that this is extraordinary. And I put the book down, went to look on the internet to see what else I could find out about her. Her book was not only still in print in Chinese, it was available in English. I ordered it, I had it the next day. And so, and so instead of thinking about something for five, 10, 20 years, it was all of about 26 hours. Plus all the research you've done in your whole life about China anyway. Exactly. So, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, and that, that turned out to be really great for this it. book because I had, even though I couldn't go to China, um, I had a sort of, we'll just say like a, a bucket of, of sure. um, experiences and, and at this point in my life knowledge that I could rely on. Yeah, I mean, the, the verisimilitude in the book just come, comes through whether mm -hmm. you got there or, or not. Yeah. So you knew the culture, all the aphorisms, the yin and the yang. The, 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 yeah. Yeah. Right, but even something like, she, so she lived in a town called Wuxi, which is a water town in the Yangtze Delta. And so in the Yangtze Delta, they have all these little, you know, these little towns that are built right on the water. The way to visualize them is like a mini, you know, like a, what's the, What's the plural of Venice? Venices? Venice? 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 <laughs> yeah, so like many little Venices all through this area with canals mm -hmm. and all of that. And so while I hadn't been to Wuxi, I had been to many of those other village uh, town, water towns and had stayed in them. So I felt pretty confident about writing about what a water town looked like. I felt very confident about writing about the big compound home that she lives in with her husband's family. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this, she was from a very elite family, a family you know, on her father's side, um, you know, generations of imperial scholars. Uh, she married into a very wealthy family and they lived in one of these big compound homes where you live with like a hundred of your relatives my idea of hell, and um, your, especially your husband's relatives, and then all the people who take care of you. But I had been, I've been in many of those houses when I've been in China doing research. Um, there was one time, I'm trying to remember where I, what book it was for, maybe one of the mysteries, and I was coming back towards Beijing, and this was uh, between Pingyao and Be Beijing, and, um, the driver said, I want to just take you, you know, off to see this house. And it was the former home of a salt, very wealthy salt merchant. And I don't know, it has something like, you know, 500 rooms kind of thing. And I'm walking around in there and think, this looks weirdly familiar to me. And it was where they filmed uh, Raise the Red Lantern. Oh, it's okay. So, you know, that was just an example of one. And, but it, that house in particular did kind of become a model for the house that she lives in. But you also, I mean, the, the names of these, I, I just wrote down some of them. They're in the Mansion of Golden Light and in the lodge of um ritual ceremony so they, these grand names but what really for me at least besides being just fascinated by the externals of the book is that you manage to get into the character because any good novel works because you right. care about the characters and and <clears throat> what's interesting as well is you you have i think a construct i'd love for you to talk a little bit more about through chinese as it astrology or what where people are born in a year and they're given these characteristics so the two main characters in this book are from the year of the snake, the metal snake, which is a mm -hmm. different snake, and the husband's the year of the dragon. And so maybe you can talk about how these, these kind of cultural and um, philosophic constructs that are within the Chinese culture um, work with you, for you, against you in your own mm -hmm. writing, development of character and um, structure. Yeah, I was very lucky many, many years ago to be at a uh, festival at, um, uh, what museum was it? It's the, um, uh, it, it's in, in Pasadena, you know, the old um, Grace Nicholson's house. And it's I can't remember the, 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 name, yeah. the Pacific yeah. Asia Museum. There you go, Pacific Asia Museum. And they had these like fortune tellers and different things. 
And one of them what, did your astrology. Mm -hmm. And I was there with my husband and my kids, and we each got one of these things, you know, paid a ticket, you got your little rolled up scroll. And the next morning over breakfast, I started reading these. And I was like, let's just guess who's who. And these were so accurate to the oh, four really? of us that it was just, it was mind blowing. And so I ended up getting that book, which was kind of like a, you know, old fashioned yellow pages. And I've used that ever since to develop characters, um, you know, from in China, um, you know, the good attributes, the bad attributes, who you should marry, who you really shouldn't marry. And these were things, even when I was a kid, that in the family, they would say like, oh, you know, a, um, a, a horse should never marry a rooster because the rooster is always going to ride on the horse's back. You know, these, these kinds of things where it was like, okay, well, maybe you would get married, but pro it's probably better if you didn't. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> no, that's interesting. And, it makes yeah, and then you can, and it's actually, it's a really interesting way to think about characters because here you have certain characteristics that are laid out. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I, I remember with Snowflower and the Secret Fan, the two girls were both born in the year of the horse. But one was sort of a plodding horse, you know, very down to earth. And the other one was kind of, um, I guess you'd say more like a thoroughbred, you know, just beautiful racing. and racing and the kind that would want to, you know, like fly off the cliff. And, and so you can take those ideas and, and, and sort of play with them within, with, in and around them. Yeah. Well, how, <clears throat> how in developing this, how did history and the characters work in your plotting the book? Did, I assume each book develops probably a little bit differently than the others, but was this one plotted beforehand? Did you find it? Because I won't, I won't give away the story, but within this story, which is surprising to me and sort of the kind of aha you go because of course there is a mystery and a murder and um you you're sort of going along and so that i leave you with finding out where that is so i haven't spoiled it but that's interesting but where did you go in plotting and structuring and seeing mm -hmm. the whole story well the first thing i started <clears throat> with uh were uh, the things that are in the book that she wrote so that there she had several of her male relatives who wrote forwards and then a couple of them who wrote afterwards mm -hmm. and um they but you know they're all saying different things about her life but she also wrote an introduction so she talks about um how she lived with her grandparents and that her grandfather loved for her to recite poetry to him in the evening when he drank wine and I'm going to have to paraphrase this, but, you know, apparently he said, you know, this girl is too smart to just sit around and learn embroidery and recite poetry. We should teach her my medicine. And he was what was known as a literati doctor, a doctor who learns by reading books. Mm -hmm. But her grandmother was a hereditary doctor who had learned from her parents and their parents and so on. And so really her grandmother was her main teacher. So that's one thing that's in there. But the other is just her cases. So even her cases gave me plenty of plot, uh, yeah. right? So the little girl who suffers from food damage caused by excessive love, or um, there's the woman who is suffering, you know, I can't remember what her disease is, but caused from uh, too much weeping. And let's see, uh, the young wife who's just given birth, who's suffering from something called postpartum wind itching. <laughs> you don't want to have that. I can just guarantee you, you do not want to have that. But though, and those are all believed to be the women and girls who lived in that family mm -hmm. compound, uh, whether they were from the elite families, concubines, wives, spinster aunts, or the servants. But there are these other cases that don't make sense. The woman who holds the tiller on a ship, yeah. another one of the brick and tile maker. So these were her actual cases. And so from the very beginning, I was like, well, how did she get out to meet those people? You know, she was a, a, a Confucian woman. 
Um, she was a wife, a mother. She really did follow the rules. And Confucius, he didn't have a lot of love and respect for women. I mean, he really didn't care for them. And so he has these sayings like, an educated woman is a worthless woman, and a, a woman should never take more than three steps from her front door. And yet somehow this woman did. So as I started to lay out the plot, I first of all, I had her cases. Mm -hmm. But also, I really thought about how in those days, people thought about the four stages of a woman's life. So milk days when you're just a little kid, um, the hair pinning days when you, you, you're sort of 15, they've pinned up your hair, you look ready for marriage. And I think we have an equivalent to that even now, even Rice if you're not, salt. you know, you, even if you're not going to get married, you yeah. still are sort of out and about in life. And then rice and salt days, those days of just um, grown-up chores, <laughs> we'll call it, you know, the, the, the daily yeah. stuff that you have to go through to keep a household running and all of that, and then sitting quietly this time after menopause. And, and of course, she never sat quietly, but it was a way to frame her life. And then just one more thing, and I'm sorry, I'm just blabbing on, but I also was looking um, just at the history of the time and so one of the things that I found was that smallpox uh, raged through China every three years. And China uh, invented something called variolation, which, as you know, was they, they would take the scabs and, um, from people who died and grind them up and then through a long tube, blow it into someone's nose. Uh, that was one way to do it. But, Another was to take the, the gooey matter and then from somebody who was sick with smallpox and rub it, let's say, on a baby's nose. So you can imagine there were some problems with this. Um, sometimes people got sick, they died, they would be scarred. But if you made it through, you, you were protected from smallpox. What really struck me was how the language about that was exactly what we were hearing, you know, during COVID, during COVID and with, with the introduction of vac vaccination vaccines. So that was one. And um, certainly, I think when uh, I was nearly done with the book, when the Dobbs decision came down, but I you know, this is a book very much about female reproduction, about who has a say over women's bodies. Um, this is something that people were talking about 500 years ago. It's something they were probably talking about in caveman days and probably will still, when we're all on Mars, you know, people are going to be arguing this question. Well, I think we have to worry about whether we have to start binding our feet. You know? <laughs> Because this is really a telling begin opening of your book. And we've all heard of the feet binding, but you get very technical and show how that what that does and what that does to a woman. And but yet it's considered very sexual and sensual mm -hmm. if your feet are bound correctly. So for the women, you have the bound feet. The men get concubines, and the goal of them all is to get a male heir, right, for, for the family to, to go on. So. It, it, it just plays those themes that we still see all the way through today. Um, will you talk a little bit about the yin and the yang? Yes, yes, I <laughs> what know. That that mean, was, what that means for the characters and for the structure of the book and the whole society. Right. So yin and yang. So yin, female, yang, male, yin, uh, dark, um, dirty, of the earth, slimy, shadowy, uh, yang, bright, heavenly, filled with light, you know, anything that was negative really about women and all the good stuff about men. Well, okay. So, you know, the whole universe is always in, in this kind of um, struggle between yin and yang, this balance, you could just even call it good and evil, right? But all, light and dark, everything, it's this constant throughout the universe, but it's also going on in our bodies. And so how you, you know, in Chinese medicine, how you try to find that balance again between yin and yang so that your chi, your life force is strong. 
but another thing that I was thinking about with this is that uh, Tanya and Shun and her grandmother are healers, right? But the men in their family and the grandfather who became a literati doctor, he had retired, but what they all worked for something called the Board of Punishments. Yeah. And this was the sort of the ministry in um, government ministry in China that uh, the, the men would investigate crime, they would hold the trial, they would make the sentence. And these sentences, of course, were just uh, really brutal. And so it struck me that even within her own family, there's this kind of it's not a struggle, but it, you know that you see both sides, one side where they're healers and they're trying to prolong life and they're bringing life into the world. And the other is, a, is about the terrible things that people do to each other, suffering, death, um, torture, and all of that. What's interesting, it was also interesting to me in terms of just the, the, the medical analysis that goes with that is the, the understanding of the emotional context that often preceded and was part of whatever the rupture was mm -hmm. that it connected with the the in, internal spirit. Let me just read. I'd like to just read. There's so many wonderful aphorisms and quotes in Lisa's language. So I'm not even sure. I think this is yours and not a Chinese aphorism, but I think okay. it um, displays it. The, the the book is centered on two characters. One is this doctor, and one is this young girl who's the daughter of a midwife. She has distinguished because she has big feet. Her feet have not been bound. So it's two different cultures. But the grandparent, father, grandmother, I guess, saw the importance of these two young girls who were completely isolated becoming friends at a very young age. And so the whole book follows this friendship. But at a certain climatic point, um, I think you say not the aphorism, but I think it's good. Um, you were a pearl in your family's palm. I'm merely a pebble that has been tumbled and smoothed to give pleasure, I can't read my own writing, of appearance, but all the while I am but hacked mud. Hacked mud, yeah. And so this, it, 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 so what's powerful in the book is the characters because you get inside the struggle of these women trying to support each other, see each other, break out of the strictures that society has put on them and, and figure it out without becoming marching with placards or becoming protests, but in their own way, um, protesting and the dynamics that put them under a, you know, I wouldn't even say glass ceiling. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. a complete, uh, a complete yeah, bubble. The, yeah, the thing with Mei Ling, of course, she's the daughter of a midwife yeah. and she's training to be a midwife. And in in those days and until very, very recently in China, uh, doctors didn't touch blood. Um, it was only, you know, it was touching blood. It was, again, thanks to Confucius, seen as one of the lowest of the lowest things so that butchers, midwives, people who helped coroners, coroners, they're, they're all getting their hands dirty in blood. And so they're seen as very, very low. And I think Mei Ling, although she has this incredible to me, um, kind of bravery and persistence, there is a part of her that has bought that. Has bought the story. Yeah, has bought that I'm, I'm dirty and I'm, I'm not worthy and I'm not worthwhile that she whatever the thing I I wrote you wrote that you wrote I did that, write you that, that but of course it's, you know that I'm just packed aphorism. mud yeah, you know yeah, just yeah. that that sense that I'm just dirty but um Tan Yanshan she also has her things that she's working on I guess is how we would call it today um that she is in effect orphaned in, in, I mean, mm -hmm. she's not technically an orphan, but she is kind she of is, orphaned, yeah. and that it takes her a long time to, well, the title, you know, to find her circle of women, to find, to even realize that it's there, I think, yeah. is, is more important, that she doesn't, she, because she sees herself as alone, um, she does, she can't recognize all the people around her who are who are helping her and supporting her. Yeah, well, without giving away the, the, the whole story and plot, maybe you could talk a little bit about what that circle of women does and the importance of it. 
Well, um, maybe I should talk about who these people are. Okay. So there is her grandmother. Um, there's also her father's concubine, Miss Chen, who is, you know, somebody who's been bought and sold and, you know, bought into this family to be the, con you know, the beautiful young concubine for her, for Tan Yanchen's father. And um, Miss Chen accompanies uh Yanshan when she moves into her grandparents house in the grandparents house there are um these other people there's a spinster aunt who um is kind of a interesting character but someone who you know that this kind of category of women who didn't get married or they got married or they were engaged to be married and their betrothed died when they were 15 and so they've lived this whole life as spinsters and they're not thrown out on the street but they're they're there to do sewing and tell jokes and tell stories be in, be entertain you know entertain. the status is connected to the man yeah the status is connected and then her mother-in-law who uh i had a mother-in-law i'm now a mother-in-law and i think this is one of those very complicated relationships we have in life and so is her mother-in-law who she appears to be i think that's a character who I, I think all of these characters really change quite a bit over time and also uh tan yan shun's perception of them changes of who she thinks they are poppy her the the servant who was yeah. given to her at birth and um there's a scene in here uh, when she's already moved to her grandparents and um, Poppy sleeps on the floor and there's another servant who comes in and you know they they'll talk and gossip and they're talking about where they came from and Yanshan has never questioned it has never thought about it it's just this this girl has always just been here to take care of me so I thought about this kind of circle the circle in really two ways one is just uh, I guess you could say the circle of ranking where women are, you know, whether they're servants or concubines or wives or these spinster aunts or widows or working women all the way up to the empress and then sort of that that cascade back down and and that all these women are on this same circle, we'll call it. It doesn't matter whether you're a servant or a working woman, or the empress, we all do share in this common biology and physiology. And, you know, if you're um, working in a kitchen somewhere, or you're the empress and you're pregnant, that baby still needs to come out. We'll just say it's going to have to come out somehow, some way, sometime. And so I, I, and that hasn't changed, you know, that doesn't change. It doesn't change across time it doesn't change across geography this is something that really unites all women around the world and then the, the other was a circle more you know this this way the kind of enveloping mm -hmm. way and that it, like i said it just takes her a long time to figure figure that out let's just say. And to find this the strength in that's, her own identity right. within the deal no that's yeah. it's interesting i was recently asked to do a a piece about mothers on Mother's Day, and it began with there's one thing that everybody, it's all universal. cultures, all religions, all races have in common, and that's the mother. They also have a father, but sometimes it's a little less clear who that is, but it is a mother. So if you go into a culture you don't know and you see a mother with a child, it's just a, a bond that, that you know, and I think that that comes through with that. Um, let me, I just want to read a few more of your okay. words. And then I think we want to open it to questions. Um, a few that I think these are mostly yours, Lisa. I wrote, I wrote down lots. There are m so many wonderful aphorisms within the book that you, uh, you can maybe tell us how you found them and planted them. But um, you talk about her heart um, as strong as iron and that life um, without a friend is death. And I think that's that's the moment of, there, there's several moments in that where that, where that resonates. And then one more, if I can read my writing. Um, da, 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 um, uh, don't allow yourself to be a jade hairpin that falls into the mud. 
Like now that is, is that is that is a sort of classic warning to yeah. daughters to a young of, woman you know to a young woman mm -hmm. don't don't you know don't don't do anything where your hair is going to get messy because you're going to be in serious <laughs> trouble <laughs> yeah yeah so that's that one is a traditional aphorism and warning warning to young women and did you collect all the aphorisms and just or just knew them because of all the research you had done in um but you probably well, had to know them in their historical timing so you yeah you i mean i you know were. i you have to i can't be something that's yeah, only 100 yeah, years exactly. old it has to have been around for yeah. a while so i um you know it's a variety i you know i have notebooks that filled yes. with things yeah. like this from having been writing these books for 30 years so um yeah i mean i i can go in in my office i just have a lot of stuff yeah, so you know where they are yeah. Yeah. yeah and then but then i also tried to you know china actually has a much larger bigger robust tradition of women writing mm -hmm. and also those things being preserved so there, you know, there were women write, who were writing in the Ming Dynasty, writing poetry and stuff like that. So, you know, sometimes just reading what they wrote, some of their images um, can, can inspire me to, you know, how the moonlight comes in through to a room or um, something like the jade hairpin, you know, that, that, that jade hairpin um, image is used by men and women you know for for men it has it's a it's a little sexier right oh the jade hairpin spread across the moonlit bed it's like oh yeah okay you know we <laughs> again, get it again, again. we get it what you were doing you know so the, but 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 that you know that's a common image and so to see how it's used by men but also how how it was used by, by women, women. Yeah. Did you, did you, I know to, to know Chinese and be fluent in Chinese is hard, but have you studied and had to study the language or most oh, of these been translated? Mo, I, um, no, yeah, I mean, I, my family spoke the Sayup dialect mm -hmm. and I could understand quite a bit when I was a little kid, now just food really. And then uh, I studied Mandarin for about four years. I got pretty good, but the minute I stopped studying, it went out of my head. Away. So when I'm doing, when I'm there and, and doing not, it's not every book, you know, but like Snowflower, uh, where I was in a very remote area, then I hire someone who speaks that local yeah. dialect. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Well, let's open it up to questions, both here and online. And if you have questions, if you'll go to the microphone so that the everybody online can hear you and it's being recorded, I think. Thank you. Uh, we do have a question online. Um, were you interested in medicine before working on this book, and has it impact, impacted or altered your understanding of physicians? That's a really great question. So um, my family did use a fair amount of Chinese medicine, but not like as much as some families where I'll hear like, oh, they were always cooking herbs in the kitchen and it's, mm -hmm. you could smell it all through the house. But when I was 19, uh, I, uh, I, I guess I'm just going to have to say this. I have an autoimmune disease, and I, I, um, this was the first big flare-up. Nobody knew what it was at the time, and I couldn't walk. And um, my mother, and my mother was just in a panic, mm -hmm. and uh, and on, you know, very worried. And she was out to dinner one night in Topanga Canyon and uh, at the next table they were talking about an acupuncturist who had been brought to uh, Los Angeles to teach a class at UCLA. He was the first sort of legitimate acupuncturist to come to California and probably just about anywhere in the country. And she asked like, how, how do you see that guy? How could you, how can I get my daughter in to see him? And so it was one of these things where you would call, you know, because it was completely illegal, you know, call, let the phone ring three times, hang up, let the phone ring once, hang up. <laughs> and um, acupuncture was illegal. Oh, there was, yeah, it really? was, oh. was, it was 
yeah, it's still relatively recent mm. anywhere in this country. I mean, by I mean, I'm old now, so that was just still it's still relatively recent. Anyway, so I went to see him, and that very first time that I went to see him, I walked out without a limp. And so I have been going to traditional Chinese medicine doctors all along, but I, you know, I see everybody. I just, whatever works, I'm going to try it. And if it doesn't work, okay, well, I'll go on to something else. But I, but I um, feel like I've, you know, used it myself and that I had so many people in my family who had used it. So at least it, it wasn't something that I was going to completely like not knowing what it was and starting from zero. Hi, what advice would you give to writers who are writing about Asian or Asian American history, particularly in terms of research or marketing, because historical fiction always has to fight a bit to get out there? Yeah, well, I would say that this is a really great time. It's not like, you know, even 30 years ago where there just were very few um, Asian American, well, writers at all who are being published. But now if you, you know, you can go to any bookstore and you can see that there's this growing body of work that is out there. And I would, first of all, I would suggest that you read whatever you can find that other people are writing and, and the the breadth of what's being written now and being published is so extraordinary and inspiring. So, you know, it's everything from, uh, you know, short, I don't know if you read um, Fiona and... Jane and Fiona. Yeah, Jane and Fiona, you know, those sort of linked short stories, uh, very contemporary over to all the way over to sort of science fiction and everything in between. So I would say really read all of that. And then as far as the research, just, you know, that not every novel requires research, but I think most do, even if it's taking place right here in this city right now today, you still need to know certain things and be accurate about them. So I think just do the research. I, I happen to over research because I love it so much, but don't be afraid of it and know that that can inspire you, um, but that you can also get to a point where you say, okay, I'm done and now it's time to sit down and start writing. Like what, pla like what places would you look for like uh archives or museum or research libraries are, are there any that i would suggest yeah yeah i think there are a lot of places um, but i don't know what you're looking for so maybe afterwards you can come up and you know you can tell me a little more specifically about what what kinds of things you want you're trying to research thank you yeah hi my question um, is that in all of your novels it's clear that you do a lot of research and how do you balance all the research that you do with your writing? That's a great question. And I don't, should I repeat? Because I don't know, did you all hear it because of the because siren? Of the okay, siren. yeah. So how do I balance that? So I, like I just said in the, from the last question, I completely over research. It is my favorite part of the process. Um, to me, it's like a big treasure hunt. I never know what I'm gonna find. And I find things and I'm just like, <laughs> Oh, goody. What am I you know? do with this? Oh, yes. What am I going to? Oh, smearing smallpox goo on a baby's nose. I'm in. You know, how, where am I going to use it and how? And so, um, you know, I, I love that part of the process. And, and this time, maybe that if there are no other questions, we can talk about how research was different this time because of COVID. But um, I, when I, so, a book typically takes me about two years. The majority of time is spent on the research. The writing is actually the least amount of time and the editing is somewhere in the middle. So um, obviously that research, it means a lot to me. And I, when I write the first draft, it's very, very long because I have to include everything that I found. I mean, I found it, I wanna use it. And then I start pulling it, when I'm editing, I start pulling it out. And I think of it sometimes like um, that game Jenga, you know, so you have the tower and then you start pulling stuff out and you want that tower to still stay strong, you know, steady and be sturdy, but, and not collapse, but there's enough to hold it up. And this really um, came from my editor 
uh, Bob Loomis, uh, who I had for mm -hmm. three or four books before he rudely retired at age 85. And um, he, he, for Snowflower and the Secret Fan, there was a chapter where uh, the three girls are making bound foot shoes for their weddings, for their true, sort of their, you know, trousseau kind of thing. And um, Beautiful Moon is stung by a bee and she dies. And when I had been in China, I got to meet the oldest living new shoe writer. She had bound feet. She taught me how to make bound foot shoes. She taught me how to make wedding quilts. And I had all that in there. And Bob called me and he said, well, what do you think that chapter's about? Is it about how to learn how to make bound foot shoes? Or is it about beautiful moon dying? And that lesson has stayed with me to today um i i i can you do an article on how to make bound foot shoes <laughs> yeah i <laughs> could i mean that's you the should. thing he you said you could do you know that but that's something else that's for somewhere else and that that's the difference between a novel and an article or nonfiction is that you need to connect to the characters and what they're going through and be there in the room with them and with their emotions now, one thing that I might mention is Lisa's website is sort of wonderful because those are the kinds of things that you put on the website as backstory for the novels. Exactly. So, I have what they, it's a step inside the world of, yeah. for each book. So step inside the world of Tea so, Girls, step inside so the world of, So you can of, take yeah. some of that and um, for, for many novels, I, some of, especially with the young writers, which you, you are very experienced, but you have a lot of scaffolding because you sort of need it yourself because you need to know what's happening. You have to know how to get rid of the scaffolding. Right. Yeah. But you can put it on your website. Yeah, I have That's it on good. my website. I have yeah. photos and videos and all kinds of things that then you can explore. Oh, I don't know, wedding traditions and foot binding and um, medicine and, you know, just all of these different things that were part of the research for the book that I know people kind of want to take a look at and peek at. Yeah. One more. Hi there. I was just wondering, um, in all of your books, you seem to have a female friendship theme. And I'm wondering what, why that is always a constant in all of your books. Well, it, it's, it's not 100% a constant. I did have a pair of sisters once for two books. <laughs> but um, it is something that I keep going back to. And um, they're really two reasons for it. I think one is that um, my, my mother had two best friends from when they were in seventh grade, literally until the day she died. And my sister has had a best friend since they were three months old. I don't have someone like that in my life. And I'm also alone a lot. You know, I, I, um, I'm just in my room working. And so I I haven't had those kinds of friendships myself. <laughs> I mean, so you, I, you write them. I, I write them because I, and I think this would be what it would be like to have that. But this would also be like what it would be like to have that because what happens in a friendship? You know, we will tell a friend something that we wouldn't tell a boyfriend, a lover, a husband, our mother, our children. It's a very particular kind of intimacy. And of course, every time, anytime you have your heart completely open like that, you are vulnerable to being hurt. And so for me, I it's something I've always longed for, and yet I've have also seen those sort of dark shadow sides of friendship and wherever I see those shadows that's where I want to go yeah. well that's also the nature of drama and good writing is some conflict mm -hmm. they were all happy the whole time I'm getting uh, um you had a you touched on it briefly your process there's a question online because this is the American Writers Museum they really want to know a little bit more about your day-to-day -day process do you write daily how long in a particular room while drinking tea or listening to music you know in short what's your technique for getting that first draft written yeah so um I I like I said I do a tremendous amount of research and there are certain and, and really I think for me a lot of it is just how I organize it so certain things I think of as being unmovable um 
Tan Yanchen, born in a particular year. Her father became an imperial scholar. These are dates that are known in a particular year. Um, there was a small, particular smallpox epidemic that was particularly bad in this particular year. Um, uh, the emperor became the emperor in a particular year. So t I look at those kind of like signposts that are unmovable. I can't play around with them. I can't move them. I have had editors say, well, who cares, you know, if you move them? And then I'm like, well, if I tried to move the date of the bombing of Pearl Harbor, would you care? And it's like, oh, you know, you can't move that. <laughs> but, but, you know, you can move stuff in your book. Nobody will know. And I was like, but I will know. So, okay, so these are the things that are unmovable. And then there are things that, um, are more do, have to do with the plot. So, um, you know, let's, uh, these two little girls are gonna meet. Eventually they're gonna get married. Um, typically it takes about nine months to have a baby, but sometimes less, sometimes longer, you know. So um, I know that there, I'm not saying there is a rift, but let's pretend there was a rift that there's going to be a rift and then there's going to be some resolution these things you can kind of move around you know they're also signposts and so they're in there with those ones that are permanent so then when i sit down to work to write in the morning i um because i'm a morning person for the person who asked that question online i get my tea and i drink very good tea and uh, I don't know how I'm going to get to that signpost, but I know that's where I'm going. And to me, that's, that's the truly creative part where you're just trying to sort of tune into the universe and, and be with these people and get them to that signpost. But I don't know, but I don't know how I'm going to get there. They sometimes help you get there by telling you how to get there. Yeah, right. they tell me how to get there because they're they're in charge. I'm just I'm just uh, the fingers. Go ahead. Could you go to the microphone just so our so our oh, here's the microphone. Hi, I noticed that this has a similar layout to um, Snowfire and the Secret Fan. Yes. With as they're both in us sort of a similar era, although not that similar if you think about it. And I also noticed that um, I own the sea women, sea women has a very similar female friendship to Snowfall and the Secret Fan, whereas two lifelong sister figures eventually split over this huge rift. What was, which, how is writing each book different? And I know it sounds like I just wrote the same book three <laughs> times. Dang, but um, them. <laughs> but they're but they are different, and I do feel like this is something that again is very common in women's lives, where we will say in kindergarten, you know, you meet someone in kindergarten, we're going to be best friends for life. Well, sometimes you are, but often you aren't, and then. Maybe you meet someone in high school and you're going to be best friends for life. Maybe you are, maybe you weren't. And in college, often you think for sure, you know, like your roommates or whatever. But that often does, it doesn't really work. I mean, yes, it does. In the case of my mother and my sister, it did work that way. But for most of us, I think we have people who kind of come and go in our lives. And sometimes that person that you were really close to as a child, you could have 30 years where you don't see them, and then you come back and you can connect immediately because those those people knew you when you were still purely you. So I I I you know the stories are obviously very different, but I do feel that this relationship is so unique for what we can experience in the world. And if you don't have it, you kind of you long like me, you long for it. I'm surveying the audience, and I noticed that the majority are women, uh, primarily. Uh, no, do you have a lot of male readers or? Is there so a you know um eighty five percent of all books are bought by women, so I you know i I think we're I think we're well 
Where I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I, I actually, um, some, some of my biggest fans are men. And um, there was one who has written everything on um, Wikipedia about me. He's done everything. I mean, a another one who writes to me every single day for probably the last 10 years. How are you doing? Are you OK? Here's a picture of me on my boat with my wife. And here's the do new dog. And, um, you know, and and um, I, I I think sometimes and I'll just tell you what my dad said when he read one of my early books, he said, you know, men can be really pretty awful, can't they? <laughs> and, and, I, you know, and, and it's like, well, I'm not really writing that, but I am writing about these these time periods where women were really separated, actually, from men in the way that we think of, you know, if you think of a marriage today. Um, where you might talk about politics, you might talk about how the kids are doing in school, you uh, would go out to dinner and a movie. But in those days, it, it really was like a, a whole other, the men were out there and the women were over here, and you weren't really having those, those that kind of relationship where it was in any way equal, or in any way designed even to have much in the way of companionship, although you know that that ideal was to strive to have a companionate marriage where at least you could be friends. But if you've just been brought together, you know, um, in an arranged marriage with just the one goal of having a son, this is not really designed for um, deep connection. Also, you know, within the book, there's a whole section where she goes to the great within. I mean, you have the great within and, and the without, which, which if I can just insert another question, do, do you have or, or do you know if you have a, a large readership in China? And what do you have anything you can say without getting in too much trouble about China today? Um, I, my books have been pub were published pretty regularly in China until um, Dreams of Joy. And then um, Island, of, uh, sorry, Tigrel of Hummingbird Lane had been had been bought, had been translated, and then Trump did the um, embargoes, and then you know the, all the tax stuff, and that was that for that book. You know that was one of the things that fell by the wayside. So w w actually, what's been interesting for the last two books is that there are a lot of schools of translation in China and off of the last two um, books, young students have asked permission to translate a book of mine that hasn't been translated yet into Chinese. And then they're the ones who take it to a publisher. So it's been like a, you know, a, a graduation project for them. And then something that goes on so that they get their first kind of business credit. And it doesn't bump against current Chinese politics, so that's No, I think when, a, you know, um, I don't know if anybody saw the film of Snowflower and the Secret Fan, I, I think it's fair to say it wasn't very good, but one of the things, uh, you know, that was one of seven films, that American films that were filmed in China in that year, and uh, of course you're dealing with all kinds of censorship. The only thing that they cut was that you couldn't see any bound feet, you couldn't hear anything of the practice. There's only one place where you hear a bone break. Really? So they allowed one bone to break, you know, one crack, and then that was that, but which was probably enough. Are they de know? denying the history? I mean, in the, a denial that's of the one history? of those things that they feel is kind of shameful and embarrassing that they had that in their history. So it's really not something they um, like to advertise, how, I guess. How long a period were bound feet? I mean, this- It lasted about a thousand years. A thousand years. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you, you, you'll see it in this book with great gasps. Yeah. So um, with that, um, I'd like to thank Lisa C. and Joanne Lita Mackerman. Thank you. thank you both so much. This has been a wonderful program. And